Oh, sorry, was that my cue? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Hi, y'all. My name is Donna and I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is May 30th, 1997. Um, I have a sponsor who has a sponsor. I've worked the steps many times. I moved three times in sobriety and I got sober down in Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. Um, let's see. I grew up in an alcoholic home like a lot of us. My dad was the alcoholic. He was a mailman and back then they carried that big leather bag and I grew up in Northeast PA in a little town called Pittston. It's up near the Binghamton, New York state line. So I grew up in the mountains and he would stop at every corner bar and there were a lot of them back then to have a drink while he was delivering mail. My mom allowed no alcohol in the house. Um, I don't think it was a happy marriage because well, he slept on the couch all the time and she stayed in the bedroom, but there were seven kids. So something had to be right there. But anyway, as being one of the oldest of the kids, I uh, grew up in a lot of fear from my dad. He was extremely abusive uh, in any way that you could possibly imagine. And a lot of fear. He was loud. He was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He would come home. He, um, I used to say my parents were strict. I later found out in life that my dad was abusive. Uh, that took me a long time to swallow that because I just thought it was being strict. He would say, sit in that chair and don't move. And I did not move. Now, my other siblings would laugh at me and say, what's he going to do? But I didn't do it. Hence, I grew up being a rule follower. And that kind of gets in the way sometimes these days. But I did grow up in a lot of fear. And um, till I was about 16, and that's when I discovered alcohol. And alcohol gave me that liquid courage to stand up to my dad. I was an introvert, I still am an introvert. And that liquid courage gave me a voice and I loved that. And I could stand up to him and try and tell him that things aren't gonna happen anymore. And um, I did that. But then it's such a twisted uh, relationship. I felt bad because he was mad at me. So I also have a history of six suicide attempts. And my first one was when I was 16 years old. I, had, I was mad at my dad and I had put my hand through a glass door, a sliding glass door. And he was our mailman. So I timed it for when he was gonna be at our house with the mail. And he came in and it was bleeding pretty much. And he said, um, well, I'm working. I can't take you to the hospital. So he put a slice of bread on top of it. Ask your mother. So my mom was taking a bath and I went up and told her that I cut my arm. I need to go to the hospital. And she said, how many times do I have to tell you kids when I'm taking a bath? That's my private time. Find somebody else. So my brother was a little bit younger than me and he ended up taking me to the hospital with no driver's license. And when I get to the hospital, the doctor comes out and it was during football season and he looked at it and he goes, oh, this is a mess. I guess I'm gonna miss the rest of the game. And I share that story because to me, that tells me a lot about self-worth. And I grew up with no self-worth. To think that other things were more important. Actually, I ended up with 100 stitches inside, 100 stitches outside. I had cut an artery. So that went on, and then that just made me feel like nobody cares. That whole situation that gets us into drinking to, uh, sorry, mind, to not feel that way, to feel better about myself. And like I said, when I drank, I had a voice, I partied, I could stand up to anybody. It gave me this courage. So that was one incident. And then I um, was a very strong person. I left home at 18 um, and I went to nursing school and I put myself through nursing school and I worked full time and went to school full time. And I remember, um, of course that was a help with a little um, medications 
to, to do that. But my parents didn't offer anything. It's not like it is today with children, but it, that's the way it was back then. So I did, I did go to school and I remember when we graduated from nursing school, we had this big party down by the Susquehanna River and big kegs of beer and, and a lot of stuff. And we were all down there partying because we graduated school and I could drink. I was a blackout drinker. Every time I drank, I blacked out. So what had happened is we had this big cake and the girl was cutting the cake handing out slices. And I said, wait, I want to cut my own piece because I only wanted a little one. And so she had the serrated knife and I went to grab it from her and she pulled it. I ended up cutting my finger three fourths of the way off. Now we're all there and we're all nurses and we're all drunk. And nobody, I was like, oh, this really hurts. So um, I was just standing there and I was holding it down and just continued drinking. It wasn't that much of a pain. None of us thought to go to the ER or anything. And that's how alcohol is. You're having a good time. You don't think about things like this. So finally, somebody said, you know, Donna, there's a puddle of blood underneath your finger. And then all of us nurse graduates said, oh, yeah, you're supposed to raise your hand so the blood won't drip down. So we raised the hand and it was still bleeding. So we duct taped it with paper towels. I didn't go to the ER till about four hours afterwards. And that's, that's what liquor and alcohol did for me. I didn't care. I just didn't care. And I got several stitches there and I graduated with a big bandage on my hand. And the drinking took off. I started drinking at 16 up in the woods with Boone's Farm strawberry wine, like a lot of us. Uh, I wasn't, a, I was picky on my drinks. I was uh, picking on the type of beer and the type of other drinks. The club scene came into play and it was off, off to the running with the club scene because you would go to happy hour and then you'd go dancing afterwards. And then there was always uh, a bar that was open at night till two in the morning and then you would go there. And I was, like I said, a blackout drinker. And of course I lost my car several times and I was one of those people that always came home with one shoe. I don't know where the other shoe went. I just always came home with this one shoe. Uh, I had several pairs of shoes in my closet that didn't match. I always lost a shoe for some reason. If I couldn't drive, I would walk home and I would black out in people's yards and other some places where you just really didn't know. I black out and wake up and this guy was brushing my teeth once. I said, where am I and why are you doing this? He said, well, you just vomited and your breath stinks. But that's how it was for me, blacking out all the time, all over the place, not remembering a lot of things. I do remember I had somebody with me when I was driving home drunk and I never did get a DUI. Thank God for that but I had gone down a very narrow street in Pittston, PA, and I ended up sideswiping 14 cars. So the person that was with me said, oh my God, you better stop. I said, did any of the lights come on? Cause it was like early morning hours. And he said, no, I said, well, then nobody knows. And I just kept on going. And you know, these little things, that's, that's just what, what happened, these crazy little things that sometimes got me in trouble with the law. And I'm gonna get to that shortly. Um, so I go into, go into nursing school and I moved 30 times in sobriety, my geographical moves. I didn't look at it as a geographical move. I looked at it that, whoops, they got to know Donna, it's time to go. Some of the reasons I moved was because I uh, was thrown out of every single club in Allentown, Pennsylvania, every bar and not allowed to go back in. Drinking gave me a voice and my voice gave me anger. And I would fight people. I mean, I'm five feet, 102 pounds. I would start fights. I would get behind the bar and throw glasses and I would get kicked out of all the clubs, kicking and screaming. And then I would come back and the bouncers would be like, no, Donna, you're not coming back in. 
So there was no more clubs to go to. I mean, even the local dive bars, I wasn't allowed back in because I caused a lot of trouble because I had a mouth on me. That was my liquid courage. My anger from my childhood just kept coming out and it affected a lot of people. It did a lot of damage. Of course, I was an extreme manipulator, a liar, everything that goes with this disease. So it was time to move. But see, I couldn't just move to the next town. I moved from Allentown, PA to Columbus, Ohio, because I had to get far away. Now, down in Columbus, Ohio, it, um, I had another little, little incident and um, I was partying with some people and being a nurse, a registered nurse, you could get a job anywhere. So that was good. And at that time there was a nursing shortage. So there was the travel and nurse thing going on and I signed up for that. So in Columbus, Ohio, I, um, I'm losing my train of thought here for some reason. Anyway, I'll just move on. Oh, I know, I was out partying with some friends and like I said, I blacked out. They went out to eat afterwards and they left me in the car cause I was in the blackout. And I get out of the car and I fall and hit the curb, the stone curb of the sidewalk with my head. So they call the ambulance and where do they take me? But to the hospital that I work at. Now that doesn't look good. At this time I was in a supervisory position and um, they put me in the detox unit there because I tested positive for drugs and alcohol. And I signed myself out of detox, went to my apartment, got in my car and moved again. And finally, um, I did get sober in Hilton Head. I lived in Hilton Head for six years before I got sober and we would, we would um, go down to Savannah River Street a lot to party. So that was a big thing. But while I was in Hilton Head as a nurse, that was the last place I moved to during my drinking time. And it's so beautiful down there. But um, when my mom died in 84, going back just a bit, that's kind of when I got into the drug scene. So that started in 84. And now we're in 94. No, 90 something down in Hilton Head. And I was a nurse and I was taking care of my patients. I worked at Hilton Head Hospital. And one patient said to me, um, I want something for pain. So I went and got an injection site and he wanted an injection to give him for pain. And when I went back in there, he said, I think I'm gonna try the pill instead. I'm like, no problem. So I went back to get the pill and then it got hectic and I got busy and that injection was still in my nurse pocket. And when I got home that night, it was still there. I had never put it back into the machine. And I thought to myself, oh my God, what am I gonna do now? But I um, also have a history of migraines and I used to have to go to the ER to get shots of Demerol or morphine for the migraines. So I thought, well, this will save me some money. I'll just keep it here for my next migraine. Well, what had happened after a couple of, um, after that Demerol, it took the adverse effect to me. It woke me up. Most of the time, it will make you feel relaxed. But for me, it woke me up. And I was on the 7P to 7A shift. And it's around that two, three o'clock in the morning when you're just really out of everything. And we work six days on, six days off. The days off were great. It was like a vacation. But the six days on, that's all you did was just work. So what had happened is, long story short, I ended up stealing my patient's pain medication. That I am not proud of. That still hurts me in my heart when I say that today. That's not the type of person that I wanted to grow up to be as a nurse. I always wanted to do nursing because I had a need to be needed and I like taking care of other people. So for six months, I took thousands of syringes from the hospital and I would 
right on the chart that the person got their pain medication. Now, it's not like, and I'm not making an excuse, I'm just stating facts. Nobody complained that the medicine didn't work because when you give Demerol, we also give another drug called Visceral, which is for nausea because pain medication usually causes nausea. Now the Visteral burns when it goes in. So I was taking the pain medication and giving them the medicine that burned. So they thought they were getting their medicine. Nobody was ever crying in pain or nobody asked for it any time after that. But in that six month period, if the order was pain medicine every two hours, they got it whether they asked or not. And um, I remember this nurse's aide and see this Demerol woke me up so I was able to get through my shift. But now on my six days off, because now I'm addicted to it, I needed some for home. So I had to take a lot of syringes home to justify my days off because I couldn't live without it at this point. And I'm sorry, but this particular drug is part of my story. Um, I know this is an AA meeting, but my um, drug of choice is alcohol, but my bottom was the drugs. So in six months, it took me down. I remember one morning, my supervisor said to me, oh no, I, this nurse's aide was always carrying her Bible around and praying. And I asked her that night, I said, when you go to your break, can you say a prayer for me? She said, sure. And that morning at 7 a.m., there was the nursing supervisor, the director of nurses, and she never comes in that early. And I knew, I just knew that I was caught. And I was off for the next six days. So we went down to the nursing office and she said to me, we're gonna do a drug test for opiates. And I said, it's gonna be positive. Um, I was injecting myself in the bathroom. None of my nursing staff or my coworkers had any idea what was going on. They had nothing. So it was positive and she wanted to drive me home because I was under the influence. And I said, well, my car is still here. And she said, well, where is your purse? And I knew I was caught and I knew I had syringes in my purse to get me through those next six days. So I had put them in my car before I went to see her. And I said, I didn't bring a purse. So she drove me home. I only lived a couple blocks from the hospital. I went back and got my car and came back home. I, at that point, she reported me to the South Carolina State Board of Nursing. I had to surrender my license. I was arrested. I was charged with some federal accounts of falsifying legal documents and removing narcotics from the hospital. And that was my bottom. And, and that was my career. This disease took my career. I was a nurse for 25 years at that time. I was 40 years old. That's when this disease took my nursing career. So I did some time. I had a, a hearing, I had a trial. I was facing 15 years. And I was just in awe. I had no clue that this was related to the disease being a nurse, we didn't get a lot of training on drugs and alcohol or the disease of alcoholism. I mean, I knew what an alcoholic looked like, but I didn't think I had a problem. So that was in 1996. In 1997, I'm still locked up. Um, I get out. I didn't have to serve the 15 years because my nursing coworkers, when they went to testify, had no clue. There were no people screaming that I was not impaired. I was functioning well. Uh, the patients didn't testify. 
Uh, the only reason I got caught was somebody was charged for pain medication and they said they never got pain medication when they were in the hospital, but yet it was on their bill. And that's how it came down to me. So when I got out for the nursing state board, I had a ton of stuff I had to do. I was on five years probation. For the state board, I had to call every day to see if I was to be drug tested. And if I was, I had to be there within an hour. I had to have a nursing sponsor, an AA sponsor. I had to go to a meeting every single day for five years and get a paper signed. I had to have a therapist, a psychiatrist, and all these people had to do monthly reports and myself included and send them into the state board every month. And that was my responsibility to do that. Long story short, we did this and we did this and I got my license back in 12 years. When I was 12 years sober, I got my nursing license back. I did all the work that I was supposed to do. I did all the work for the government and all the work for the state board of nursing. By the time my license came back, I uh, had gotten a lot of arthritis in my hands and I couldn't use my hands much. They weren't fast enough. So I knew I could not go back into nursing. I got into the rooms and I had uh, the best sponsor had a sponsor in Hilton Head. I was sober two years in Hilton Head before I moved to Maryland. In Hilton Head, my first sponsor was appointed to me because they asked me to find one and I, in two weeks, to pick somebody and I didn't and because I said I was still interviewing. Because they said, pick somebody who has what you have, what you want. And to me, this girl had the best looking clothes on, so that's who I picked. But they said no, and they gave me this girl named Carrie. And I was like, oh, God, not her. At every single meeting, all she talks about is God. And I was just not ready for that. I had no belief in God because of all the stuff that my dad did and still received Holy Communion, and God did not strike him with lightning. And that's what I thought should have happened, and it didn't. So there was no God for me. I... um. Worked with her until I got to, she helped me tremendously with the third step, with this higher power thing. She took me down to the beach on Hilton Head and we sat there and she said, close your eyes. Can you feel the breeze? Can you feel the sand? Can you smell the salt from the water? Can you hear the waves? And we went down at sunrise. She said, can you see, can you see the sun coming up? I said, yeah. I see all of that. Can you make that happen? I said, no. Then there's something greater than you out there. For years, I called my higher power Mother Nature because that's how I related to it. Eventually, through my 26 years of being sober, I went over to calling my higher power God. When it came time to do my fourth step, a lot of my memories came flooding back in and Carrie did not have any experience with PTSD or the trauma that I had gone through. And so she said to me, I know somebody else who can help you. So I'm going to pass you on. And I respected that because as a sponsor, if it's something that you have no clue about or you've never experienced it, but you know somebody who has, it's time to let that person go to somebody who could relate. And I respected that a lot. After two years of being sober in Hilton Head, I moved um, to Maryland, um, Montgomery County. And AA was really big up there. There were meetings all the time, men's meetings, women's meetings, big book studies. I went to a lot of conferences, went to tons of young people meetings, international conferences of young people, AA international conferences. I've been to several of them when it's like 90,000 people. I got so involved in service work. I was in inner group. I was in district. I held several positions. I did grapevine, a lot of things. I just immensed myself in service work and that has helped me tremendously. I met so many people by doing that. I met so many people that were willing to help me with my next step to go on. 
So my fourth and fifth step brought up a lot of memories, a lot. And that brings me to um, another suicide attempt. I was disassociating and I would go to the drugstore down the street from me. And when I came home, I would end up in Virginia and I had no idea how I got there. So I was having sober blackouts. So I had to go to intensive patient therapy for PTSD, which I did 60 days. And then I also entered a, at NIH in Bethesda, Maryland, they had a research program on PTSD for one year inpatient. And I also took part taking that because I wanted to get better. I wanted to change. I wasn't drinking, but I still wasn't feeling like I should be feeling. I mean, I was glad that I got past those first couple days and weeks. I mean, I used to count the time by the minute. It's like, okay, I'm not gonna drink for this minute, but the next minute, damn it, I'm having a drink. And I had to take it minute by minute to get through withdrawals and the cravings, but I did. And I did it with a lot of help from the women in the rooms. I did it with a lot of help from a lot of people in the rooms and the people in service work. So like I said, my memories were coming back. So I wanted to kill myself because I was having so much time with four and five. And it's not that I didn't want to do it. It's that it was just too traumatic at the time. So I wanted to drive my car in front of a Mack truck on 270, the highway in, in Maryland. And I had it all planned because I just wanted to die because I couldn't take it. And as soon as I opened the door, there's my sponsor. So that did not happen. But my six suicide attempts went to six mental institution stays. You try to kill yourself, you're going to the mental hospital. And I, I went through a lot of that. By the time I got to maybe my sixth or seventh year, I was done with the steps. I did not do the steps in a week. It took me years to do the steps, only because I had to stop and address some other issues from the abuse and the PTSD and be hospitalized for that. I do have a history of depression OCD and anxiety, and I'm on meds for them and everything's good. I've been on them for quite a bit. And when I was in Maryland, I, with my one sponsor, when we got to the amend state, like I said, it was several years later, the first person on my list was the director of nursing. And so I called her with my sponsor next to me. It took me several times that I hung up the phone because she was also a friend of mine down there. And I made my amends and my sponsor taught me when you make your amends, you say, what can I do to make this better? Because I'm sorry, it just doesn't cut it. So when I said, what can I do to make this better? She said, don't ever be a nurse again. And at that time, I didn't have a license, but when the 12 years came and I got my license back, I thought, well, bullshit, I'm going to be a nurse again. But then again, I ended up with all that arthritis in my hands and I couldn't open things fast enough. I had no dexterity. I had no strength. So I was not a nurse again. I ended up going to dog grooming school to to groom dogs. While I was in Hilton Head when I was first sober though, and I didn't have a job, I got a job at the, one of the golf courses driving the beverage cart. And my sponsor said, you're gonna relapse because that's serving drinks. I had no clue what golf is. They told me you need a golf shirt and khaki pants. I said, what the hell is a golf shirt? If that's the one with the little alligator on it, I ain't wearing it because that just wasn't my style. My style was rock and roll. But I did, and the little hat that said Hilton Head and all this other thing, all the Jones or whatever course I was on, Frasier, whatever, and it was 12 hours, it was from seven to seven, and the meeting on Hilton Head was seven to seven. There weren't a lot of meetings on Hilton Head at that time. 
So I wasn't, I was missing meetings and I'm driving the car and this one golfer said to me, I'd like a hot chocolate with Kahlua. So I made it for him. And I thought to myself, I've never had one of them. I wonder what that tastes like. So I made one for me. And there was the relapse and it kicked in. And so they have pony bottles down there. So I start stealing the pony bottles. And then a couple of weeks later, I'm driving around the course and I had this moment of clarity and I pulled the cart over and I said, wait a minute. I stole that, the nursing job, I'm stealing at this job. I lied at the nursing job, I'm lying at this job. I drank at the nursing job and did drugs, I'm drinking at this job. Because see, I didn't think I had a problem. And I said, hmm, these behaviors are the same, something must be wrong. Still, didn't think that I was an alcoholic. I fought that tooth and nail. I was not an alcoholic. It was just a behavior problem. And I remember going to my very first meeting in Hilton Head and I walked in and I sat in the back and it was crowded. And they said, you know, is there any newcomers here that like to introduce themselves? And we all know the newcomers when they walk in because they don't usually come to those meetings so we could spot them. So all of a sudden everybody turns their head and they're looking at me and I'm like, what? Well, aren't you a newcomer? I said, if I was a newcomer, I'd let you all know. And then it came time to share and they're at the end and they said, well, would you like to share? I said, no, if I have something to say, I'll raise my hand. And then it came time to do the Lord's prayer. I was having none of that. And it came time to um, doing the holding hands and hugging. And I'm like, hell no, I ain't having any of that either. So I was there maybe my first month and they were big in service work down there and they made me the greeter so that I could learn everybody's names and open my mouth and be nice. And that helped a lot. Service positions, service, service, service has helped me so much. I, I just can't get past that. So I got married to my husband who I met in the rooms and um, he had um, two years more than I did. I got married for the very first time at age 50. I was never getting married. I don't need a man in my life. I can handle everything. He was never married. He was six years younger. I'm gonna marry a younger man so he could take care of me in my old age. We went to meetings together. Well, by golly, after 10 years, he develops colon cancer and at age 53, he passes. And he was home with hospice and I took care of him during all that. And he passes away and here I am alone again. So hospice was there and I said, please take all of these pain medications because he had tons of them there at different strengths. I don't want anything in the house. They cleaned it all out. The next day I walk out of my house. And for some reason, there's a bottle of a little bit of bourbon left in my front yard. I'm like, there's never been any cans or bourbons or bottles or trash in my front yard before. I walk out and I'm like, okay, God, what's this? So I pick it up. I'm going to throw it away. Alcoholic that I am. I had to take the lid off and smell it first. And then I threw it away because that's just, that's just how it was. So he passed and I continued with my meetings and thank God for the women in the rooms up in Maryland. And I stayed there for three years. Um, and I just couldn't stay at that house anymore. He had no children and I had no children. So I have no children and no husband and I'm here. Um, so I moved to Tennessee. I wanted to move, but I didn't know where I wanted to go. And I had to check with my sponsor because I thought, am I running again? Because I was a runner, I moved so many times. And she said, no, you're not. So I moved to Tennessee a friend of mine from Maryland who I got sober with had moved to Tennessee and she said, well, why don't you come down this way? I had no idea where to go. And she said, Northeast Tennessee, Kingsport area. I was like, yeah, that sounds good. I didn't know anything about Tennessee. I didn't even know Tennessee was the South. Florida is the South to me. But anyway, I moved here and I bought a house 
And I started going to meetings and I'm a big fan of women's meetings. I wish we had more down here. And I got a sponsor. I've always had a sponsor. I've always sponsored people. I started working the steps again with her. I have now a huge tribe of women from the women's meetings. Actually, I have no non-alcoholic friends. All my friends are alcoholic in this area. And we go out. We have some young ones with us. We have some older ones with us. And we just, every the end of every Tuesday, we go to dinner together. Yesterday, somebody celebrated a year. We went to dinner and then we went to the meeting and they had cake. And I host the annual Christmas party and other people do the July 4th party. I mean, it's just so much fun to be with these ladies. And since I'm here with absolutely no family, they have helped me so much in terms of moving and making decisions as far as trying to do repairs to this house. So I continue to uh, go to the meetings. I sponsor one person right now. Well, maybe one and a half right now. And um, they're coming along. I don't mind sponsoring, but I do go to my meetings. I go to three, four a week. And that's what it takes for me to maintain my mind. I also have the best, absolute best connection with my higher power that I've ever had in my life. And that's thanks to this program. Me and my higher power talk to each other out loud all through the day. It's not a prayer thing, we just talk. And I cherish the quiet moments. I um, go to bed at eight, so this is late for me. I'm up at five and I have a deck outside my master bedroom and I sit there and watch the sun come up with a cup of coffee and talk to my higher power. My higher power is always with me and I choose to call him God. I am not working. I haven't worked in nursing since 1996. I've picked up some cleaning jobs. I've picked up dog grooming jobs. I picked up just odds and end jobs just to get by. And now that I'm retired, um, I have social security coming in. Of course, it's not much like most of us, but it's getting me by. I have to make some sacrifices. Sometimes I feel really alone being all by myself and I go down that road, well, nobody loves me. It's just me in this world again. How could that happen? But then again, I say, God, I'm going down this road again. You gotta get me out. And he does. And um, I can't sit here and feel sorry for myself. Although I can't say that sometimes I don't feel sorry for myself because there's a lot of things with owning a house that I don't know how to do. And I have to pay people to do it. And that's why I need extra work. <laughs> But I am one ecstatic, happy, recovering alcoholic. I cannot imagine my life without this program. I am so grateful that I was offered this gift because not everybody is. I'm so grateful that I accepted it because I'm not returning it, that's for damn sure. And um, I just wanna continue to be the good hearted, sober person my life has done. 360 degree change. I am not the person I was back then, except I'm still an introvert and I'm very quiet and shy. So I don't talk to a lot of people because I don't really do well with simple talk. Now, if you wanna have a deep conversation, I'm your gal. But um, so those things are still there that started off as a child because it was the liquor courage that gave me the strength to do other things that I did, which led me into trouble. So I will take the type of person that I am. Some people think I'm just too serious because I do not get sarcastic humor. Not my problem. So thank you so much for asking me to do this. And um, I appreciate it. I've never done this before. And I'm so glad that there's, let's see, 151 people on here right now. I've never spoke that much to uh, that much to anybody, I mean, just my little meetings before, but 
grateful. Thank Todd for having me. And um, I'll end with one day at a time, honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. That's how I do it. Thanks.